Good evening and welcome to this lecture in English. It will be interpreted into Danish on channel 2, into Swedish on channel 3, into German on channel 4. So I hope everyone is tuned in so they can understand. So my theme for this evening is marriage and universal love. And here Martinez talks about two entirely different epochs in evolution. And this for me is quite a new idea that Martinez talks about sexual evolution, the fact that we evolve sexually. We're used to the idea that men exist and women exist, and we don't imagine that that will ever cease. We know that the we are, uh, arose from male and female animals at, at some point back in our history. But um, the idea that men and women could cease to exist is for me a rather new idea. I, at least I haven't met it in any other teaching than, than in Martinus. So Martinus describes the birth or the evolution of a third sex, what the Bible calls the real human being in God's image after his likeness, or what he calls the two-polled being. And I'll, I'll get into what he means by two-polled. But we see evidence of the fact that sexuality is evolving. We see many different ways of living. Some people are very happily married. Some, some people fall in love up here uh, and go around hand in hand and are very happy. <laughs> Uh, some people are very unhappily married and trying to find out how can I get myself out of this relationship without damaging the children or ruining my economy and so on. Other people are very, very lonely. They're on their own and uh, are not very happy about it. And other people are very happy to be alone and, and independent and very happy they don't have to consider anyone else. And then there are people who are attracted to their own sex, there are people who are attracted to both sexes, and there's a lot of confusion about sexual identity. We see many young people today saying they don't want to identify with being male or female, and now you see on various forms, for example, for a British passport, you can say if you're male or female or non-binary. So you, you, you see these, there's an awful lot of change going on, and I, th I, th I think it's accelerating. Uh, I think things are changing very quickly. Uh, and there's an awful lot of sexual confusion. People don't know quite where they stand sexually. And this is one of the things Martinus wants to help us with. So, let's take this. Uh, in discussing these two very different epochs of sexuality, he says, while the basic principle of animal one-polled sexuality is that a being devotes itself only to a specific being of the opposite sexual nature. The basic principle of purely human or two-polled sexuality is simply that everyone devotes themselves to everyone. Now that's an, a completely new kind of love. And of course, by devoting oneself uh, to everyone, he doesn't mean promiscuity or some sort of immoral behavior, but a total uh, unlimited love for everybody and every living being in existence. Um, so, the section, sexual analyses play a very central part in Martinez's world picture. And uh, this can be very surprising per, for people. Why does he write so much about sexuality? Um, for one, one of the reasons he, does, he writes about it is that he says that we are transitioning, we are evolving from being animal beings to being real human beings. And transitions are usually characterized by, by being rather difficult. You've got one foot in one world and another foot in another world, and you're not quite sure where you are. And a lot of us are not quite sure where we are. Um, I should just mention that there were 
terms you might not be familiar with here, one-polled and two-polled, but I'll, I will explain those as we go along. Um, he says that in evolution we have passed the culmination of the animal kingdom, and we are tired of war, uh, all the things that Karen talked about this morning, all this, these, the refugee crisis, the wars, the uh, financial problems, and all the inequalities in life. Uh, most, of them, most of us have headed up to here. We're just so tired of it, and we're longing for a more humane, elevated kind of existence. And these longings uh, can actually come into conflict with our sexuality, because our sexuality is, if one is heterosexual, it's focused on loving one being and taking care of one specific being. And uh, uh, if you begin to take care of society and take care of people in other countries and so on, you're expanding your sphere of love. So the two areas can um, compete for your attention, so to speak and create a kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. He talks about two very different kinds of sexuality. He talks about animal sexuality and human sexuality. <coughs> and, and when he uses the word animal, he doesn't mean to be critical or derogatory. It's, um, it's just, a, just an analysis. The animal sexuality, and we have to admit that we are animals. We have mammalian organisms. The animal sexuality is based on intercourse uh, or copulation. Um, in, the, in, the Dan in, in Danish he uses the words paring, which means literally copulation or mating, and he uses that of human beings. And we don't tend to like that in English, at least, uh, for human beings, because it sounds so animal, but we, we talk about intercourse for human beings. But Martinus is very consistent and uses this animal t terminology right the way up to our level. So please don't be offended by the translation. translation. I'm just being faithful. <laughs> um, anyway, the new kind of human sexuality is based on caressing, caretine, caressing. Uh, and of course, human beings uh, mostly use both. So we are in a transitional uh, stage. So there are many difficulties in this transition. Transition, we're getting rid of the animal tendencies and the humane tendencies are growing. One of the things I want to do with this lecture is to show that the sexual principle is something very much larger than we normally believe it to be. So let's have a look at this. Um, this is a symbol of the living being. And I, I think it's actually one of the most difficult symbols to explain, uh, partly because Martinez hasn't explained so much about this part, but um, I think you need, a, need cosmic consciousness to understand this really fully. But anyway, here we have the living being, and this is the I, the I as in I am. We have the problem in English, it's not this kind of I, it's the I as in the letter I. Um, this is the I that experiences and creates life. And this is the, the ability to experience and the ability to create. And this lower part uh, is, I prefer this, the lower part is, um, the ability, uh, is the organism and the consciousness. And the orange circle is the uh, animal organism that we have at present. So these are all the energies that make up our consciousness, instinct, gravity, feeling, intelligence, intuition, and memory. And uh, they are combined in various ways. Here he just shows that all six energies are present. Um, he talks about two organs in X2. In, he calls this X1, X2, and X3. Actually, that's what one of my friends calls her husbands. She calls them X1, X2, and X3. She has, she has three X's, <laughs> which is kind of appropriate, but um, this is another kind of X. Uh, anyway, this is X1. In X2, he talks about two uh, organs. The organs for the, um, 
feminine pool and the organ for the masculine pool. And um, he says that these two organs, they, they cooperate with, with all these basic energies that we see down here. Uh, to create all our vital functions, our, our place in evolution, how primitive we are, how intellectual we are, and our appearance as the male sex, the female sex, or this new human sex. So we have three sexes, male, female, and human. So if you think you're human, you're not, you might not be quite there yet. So this human sex is this double pull being, this human being in God's image. Not man in God's image, as it says in the English Bible, because um, the human being in God's image is not a man. I'm sorry to disappoint you for the men here. The human being in God's image has both these sexual aspects, the male and the female, in total, absolute balance, and is an entirely new kind of being. But, you know, when the Bible was written, uh, that wouldn't have been understood. So... Yeah. So these, the, the male and the female pole, they form the basis for all of our, our experience of light. He calls these poles the foundation for all life experience. They um, control our experience of light and darkness and our passage between all these extremes. Uh, everything that can be experienced is experienced through these poles. All contrasts, light and dark, evil and good, sorrow, joy, war and peace, and so on. And he says here, the sexual principle or highest fire is the wheel of creation. Everything in the universe is steered by this wheel. So you see, it's a much larger uh, principle than just man and woman together, or male, animal, and female together. It's a very much larger concept altogether. So, this sexual principle controls how we experience life. One could ask oneself, how does one experience life? Martinez describes the experience of life as the meeting between the energies one sends out and the, me the energies that come to you from the universe. So it's this meeting that is life experience. And what we send out is totally dependent on our knowledge. But our knowledge in the sexual sphere is very, very limited. And that means that we, we reap what we sow, but since we have sown quite a lot of ignorance and confusion, we, we reap the consequences of that. But the ingenious thing about us, that is that we get, we get um, wiser. We, we begin to see the connection between cause and effect. If I do that, if I think that, and so on, then this happens or this happens. And, mm, maybe I should think about doing something else the next time. So you get wiser and wiser. He talks about the eye, the, the concept of the eyes turning of the energies. Um, which uh, transforms impressions into expressions. So this, is, this was the I. One can say that we experience wor the world through our physical senses, through our organism and through our, yeah, our mental and physical senses. And they go through this X2 and reach the I. And I've made a, made a chart here. So... Here we have an, an impression, we experience something, and it, um, it reaches the eye, which develops it and transforms it, and turns it into an expression. And Martinus says that this is a, a kind of sexual, imp a sexual process. So um, and this expression, in turn, turns into a new impression. So this becomes a kind of cycle. So this new impression uh, influences someone else's eye and one's own and is transformed and becomes a new expression. So you have a cycle going on here. Uh, and this is, he likens this to the sexual situation where um, the sperm 
is injected into the woman and uh, an embryo is created and after nine months the child is born. And the child grows up and produces sperm or... Um, oops, sorry. Have to become friends with... Ah! The, this, the child becomes... Um, yeah, if it's a male child, he creates uh, more sperm that, that can create a new embryo and so on. So again, it's a cycle. And um, he says that these three principles, conception, pregnancy, and birth, are three principles that hold true in all experiences of life. In English, you can be pregnant with ideas. I don't think you can say that in Danish, but you can certainly be pregnant with ideas, and it creates a birth of some sort of creation. So... He says that conception, pregnancy, and birth are three stages that all movements have to go through every time we experience something. He says that um, in that way we fertilize one another. He says here, everyone fertilizes everyone else, just as everyone is impregnated by everyone else. We are, in fact, intimately and sexually connected to the whole world in the absolute sense the experience of life is a sexual release. So, yeah, I went to school in a Catholic convent and this, they never told me this. <laughs> um, but I forgive them. <laughs> They'll get their karma for life in celibacy. <laughs> so, anyway. So, we know very little about the sexual mystery. We, we, we don't see this very, very large picture we, we only know about the connection between men and women, uh, male and female animals. We know that it promotes the, the survival of the species. But Martinus describes that particular sexual connection as one particular nuance or detail in what he calls the great ocean of sexuality or the highest fire. So let's consider what a male being and a female being are. He describes a male being as, as a being in whom or, or in which the um, masculine pole dominates and the female being as a being in which the feminine pole dominates. And I say dominates because we have within us both sexual poles. So uh, I'm obviously a woman, but I have a male pole and the men have a female pole, but in different amounts. So the male pole stands for... Um, uh, strength and power, and uh, sort of superior strength and power, um, which of course is very useful if you're a lion and you want to protect your, the lioness and your cubs and so on, you need to be strong and um, yeah, that's what the, the feminine pole is looking for, for protection, for um, uh, yeah, for, you want someone who's powerful to be able to look after you in, in a vulnerable situation. And that goes right up to our time. And we just need to, yeah, look at, we can look at people, yeah, I won't name names, but the, you, you can see people who go after people with lots and lots of money and lots of possessions and lots of power um, because it, it, it meets this, the, the need of the feminine pole for protection. But the, ma the masculine pole uh, creates uh, rivalry for beings of the male sex. So uh, men, uh, men or male animals compete for the female, and the, the same with the feminine pole. The, the feminine pole uh, means that you have lots of rivals within your own sex. So it's not an area where there's a lot of neighborly love, because you're very hostile to half the population. You're hostile to the your own sex. He also describes the, the male pole as a ta talent kernel for the sending out of energy and the feminine pole as a talent kernel for receiving energy. Those are two absolutely general principles. So at the moment I'm sending out energy, but that's coming from my masculine pole, even though I'm wearing a dress. So. Uh, um, and this, these uh, mental characteristics of these poles are actually reflected in, this, in the sexual organs. So, 
the um, male organ sends out something and the, the feminine organ receives it. So, uh, but it's, it's a general mental principle. And he says here, with these two poles, we have arrived at the innermost core of all life and all consciousness. All matter, substances, energies, forces, mental and physical functions are rooted in these two poles. All other for forms of talents in the living being are subdivisions of these two great general talents. No manifestation, no form of revelation of life whatsoever can exist without being an effect, a rhythm, or nuance in the particular mode of operation or interaction of these two poles. We can trace this interaction in every manifestation. And of course, it's obvious that in the male organism, the male pole dominates, and in the feminine organism, the female pole dominates. But he says you can trace these two poles in everything. So the combination of these two poles, as I said earlier, don't always result in a male or female, but in a double pole being, this third sex. And he describes this third sex as a being in, uh, whose femininity and masculinity have lost, lost, has, have lost their sharp, rugged contours in favor of the creation of an entirely new living being. And he describes this new living being as having a double horizon, a double ability to sense. In other words, they can sense with both the masculine and the feminine pole. So they, they can act uh, in the most masculine way if that's the most appropriate thing, but they can also act in the most feminine way if that's the most appropriate way. And by appropriate, I mean the most loving, the most um, caring, the most logical. So Martinus says rather poetically that um, uh, when, these, um, when this third sex arises, this double pole being where the two poles are in balance arises, the being gets cosmic consciousness. That means a total personal experience of the solution to everything, the solution to the mystery of life, a personal experience. You don't need to read it in a book because you get it from your own direct experience. So then all the veils are lifted. There are some old paintings about uh, some goddess lifting the veils from the truth or something, and this statue that is truth emerges. But every veil will be lifted, so we'll experience the truth for ourselves and won't need any teachers. Then we will be our own teachers. He says, uh, a totally loving and life-giving human being arises from the downfall and ruin of the murderous animals. That's us. <laughs> Sorry to tell you. Um, and of course, for this to make any sense at all, then, uh, then reincarnation has to be a fact. But I'll come back to that. Martinus divides us into various categories in various parts of Leavitt's book, The Book of Life. And uh, he does that not in order to sort of set us, put us in boxes, but in order to help us understand ourselves and to understand others, and actually in order to create tolerance and understanding. And he, he says that we belong uh, mostly to two particular types, the creative types, this, and, I uh, have to control this, reproductive types. But most of them, he says, he says, are in this middle category, the transitional types. And then for the sake of completeness, he says there also, there's also a fourth category, and they are those who neither have children nor create any, any, anything. And they are people like beggars and vagabonds and people who never do any kind of work. Uh, sorry? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. Um, 
but they could, might not even have a couch, you know. They could be wandering the streets as beggars and tramps, and but also swindlers, people who uh, earn a living by uh, cheating others. So, but if we think about the, create, the creative types, they are typically artists, they could also be scientists, uh, uh, people who are creative, uh, creative in any sort of area. Um, and if you're an absolute 100% creative type, it could be an absolute catastrophe for you to, to have a baby, for example. And um, yeah, I can think of an artist I, I knew or, or know who, um, when she was young, she got pregnant and she was absolutely sure that this baby would really stand in the way of, of her work. There was no question. So she arranged to have the baby adopted um, at birth and that's worked out very well and she's had a fantastic career as an artist. But um, So the trouble is that uh, when you're, you're a creative type but you still have these, um, the animal sexuality. So accidents can happen like that uh, and so on. So, um, of course, that's not the solution everybody would, would uh, uh, go for, but um, that was her particular solution. But you, you, you can meet many people uh, in this sort of category who feel that if they get children, well, they're really in the way, you know, I've got to practice, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to go and off, off and do my research or whatever, and, you know, they're, it's really in the way. The reproductive types, they are the types who really live for the family, for their spouse and their children and the home, and nothing else at all interests them. That's their whole world. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I certainly don't meet many people like that today, but I meet many, many people who are in this transition where they both want to be creative and do things, have a job, and, um, but they also want a family, maybe not ten children, one or two, and they want a husband or a wife or, or a partner. Um, so they're, they're caught in this transition, and this can be quite difficult. So um, Martinez calls this, this area the transition types, he calls it the, the, the zone of unhappy marriages. He also calls it the zone of unfinished talents. So those are the same, the same area. And that's because your intellect has grown so much that you couldn't be happy, couldn't be 100% happy only with family life. Um, you have another side to you that needs nourishment. And I have an example of this. Um, one of my friends, a colleague, she wanted to interview me. She was doing a, um, a thesis for the university and uh, she wanted to uh, interview me for this thesis. Uh, it was connected with what I work with. And um, the first 15 minutes of the interview, she spent crying. And this was because in order to have time to finish her thesis, she had to put her one-year-old in, uh, in childcare, eight or nine hours a day, seven days a week, until she was finished. So she was really torn. She really wanted to write this thesis. So she was in this creative type, but she really wanted to be a good mother. And the, and the two things were in conflict. And of course, the husband had his creative projects as well. So, you know, so um, I think a lot of people, uh, maybe particularly women, can recognize this, that they, they want to have a career, they want to get into politics or science or some kind of art, but at the same time they want to have children and they want to have a family. And, and the, a, a lot of young mothers today are rather stressed because they're trying to do everything. So I think this is a very common situation. Um, yeah, Martino says they're sighing and groaning and moaning under the effects of family life. <laughs> at the same time, they really want it, but they want something else as well. So, anyway, this is one way of dividing us into different sections. And one consequence of this is uh, loneliness. I mean, if I, I, I gave a lecture on this subject before, and I mentioned a song by Leonard Cohen, um, Joan of Arc. He talks about, he sings about Joan of Arc, that she, 
you know, she, she was a young girl, she um, had visions, or she heard God's voice, what she thought was God's voice, and he inspired her to go to war and fight the English uh, and get them out of France and re-establish King Charles on the, f on the throne of France. And she cut her hair short and she put armor on and rode off uh, to lead the, the army into battle. And um, I think that must come under this creative type. It's not a typical family uh, life. <laughs> And in this song, Lena Cohen says um, she was tired of the war. She wanted what she, the kind of work she had before, a wedding dress or something white, to get me through this dark and lonely night, I think. And um, so that was this reproductive uh, area. So, and I think a lot of people can, can feel that. There's, a, there's a, a, an old um, Danish, an old British criminal, a detective story. I can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, it's this woman who, uh, who's, she's played by, uh, it's Jane Tennyson, do you remember the? No, anyway, she's a, an ins inspector in the police and she, she's the first woman inspector and she's got this career and so on, but she gets pregnant Prime with a black policeman. What? Prime suspect. Yes, prime suspect. Um, and I think she's an example, it's, it's fiction, but she's an example of this mixture of a very ambitious creative type, but she has her one called sexuality. And they, there's some conflict there. Anyway, enough of diversions. Where was I? Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, yo, I, was, I was at Lena Court. Yeah, uh, I was just trying to say that, uh, that this uh, transition has its price. You can be rather lonely. And I, I took this rather long quote from a letter Martinus wrote to a man called Helmer Fodergaard. I have it here in English and Danish. Um, Helmer Fodergaard apparently wrote to Martinus because he was very lonely and he wondered what advice Martinus could give him. And Martinus wrote back saying, this, uh, this is in the middle of the letter, as for your loneliness, I understand it very well, dear Helmer Fodergaard. Sooner or later, everyone must wander along that road. It constitutes the 40 days wandering in the wilderness before the real union with the Godhead can take place. Without this wandering, no one would have any real training in giving rather than taking. It is, this zone that one learns, it is in this zone that one learns to give one's life in order to own it later. But I have come to the world to make this sacrifice or the above mentioned wandering in the wilderness easier for all subsequent generations. The radiant light of world redemption will reach the most barren and desolate ravines of the wilderness. It will shine into even the darkest and deepest abysses. And life will begin to grow everywhere. The night-like clouds of the ignorance will lift. And in the clear light of understanding, people will greet the creation of the real human being, which it today crucifies, with life's greatest warm-heartedness. And in triumphal procession, the wounded refugee will enter the glory that was prepared for him before the world was. I think it's rather beautiful. And, uh, and I think what he's referring to here, um, the creation of the real human being, which it today crucifies, I think here he's referring to homosexuality. And of course, you can be very lonely at very many stages in this sexual evolution. But I, th I think you can be lonely as a creative type because it's so important for you to be creative. Uh, that you don't have very much time to take care of your reproductive side. So, we'll go on. So let's get an overview of sexual evolution. We see here, uh, I'll take this. We see here the um, spiral cycle of ev evolution. And for those of you who are new, I'll just quickly outline it. We have the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the real human kingdom, which is a spiritual kingdom for the most part. 
the kingdom of wisdom, the divine world, and the kingdom of bliss. And these six kingdoms repeat themselves for all eternity. So this is not the beginning, it goes on and on and on down here. So, so this is a, a section of eternity. So here we are in the animal kingdom, and we see a, a male being, the green color, with a very small feminine pole, this little yellow bit. And we see a female being with a very small uh, masculine pole, the green bit. And we can see the crosses, that means they're in love with one another, they're engaged in intercourse or mating, and they become this sort of artificial uh, double-poled being. The two, the two um, polar opposites combine to create an artificial being. And this creates uh, an insta instantaneous and very brief uh, uh, feeling of God's presence. He calls it the first glimpse of the um, consciousness of God. So he describes, in a way, he elevates this sexual experience to a, a, an indirect experience of God himself. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> so um, let's see, where are we? And here we have, well, uh, we come back to that. Um, here we have a feminine being with a feminine pole and a very uh, minimal masculine pole in the middle of the animal kingdom. And we have a masculine being with a male pole dominating and a very minimal uh, feminine pole. And we see that something happens so that the male pole grows in the female being and the, and the feminine pole grows in the masculine being until the they are equal at this stage. And this is the stage in which we become man in God's image after his likeness. Here we are at the same level of consciousness as Christ. And um, here we see this double pole being who has these two sexual poles completely in balance, the, the masculine and the feminine. So this being is complete in itself. It doesn't need another half. Actually, we say that in English, he's my other half, or she's my other half. And uh, this is almost a symbol of that. So one can say that it's only in the animal kingdom that we are one-poled. It's only one in the animal kingdom that the opposite pole in our consciousness is reduced to a minimum. And we are in transition, so it's, it's growing. We are probably somewhere here. So, And we can see, see that this um, organic structure is the organic stru structure that creates darkness. Here we see the culmination of darkness and the culmination of light. So um, here our love, our ability to love, is reduced to this one specific being of the opposite sex, where here we devote ourselves to everyone and everything uh, in a total moral way. And Martinus describes the, the cosmic cycle of the pole principle as a double cycle. Because some people would say, well, it's not fair that I have to be a female being all the way through the animal kingdom, or I have to be a male being. Uh, because that's what Martina says, you don't change sex uh, from life to life. Um, but you do in the next spiral. So if we follow this female being here, in the next spiral cycle, then it's a female pole that is reduced to a minimum and the male pole that's at the max maximum, and the opposite here. So the sexual spiral is actually a double spiral. It takes two whole spiral cycles to, to complete a, a sexual spiral, so to speak. Um, yeah. So here we have the principle. Uh, this is evolution from the animal kingdom to the real human kingdom. We read it from the bottom up. We see the principle of reincarnation here. We see the white bit is the eye, uh, and these little violet squares are, are many, many lives. Here we are in the middle of the animal kingdom, and uh, here we can see that the opposite pole in our consciousness, the female's male pole and the 
males, female poll are at a minimum, but they're growing. And men and uh, human beings today are on this level and this level, and very few, Martino says, are just above this line. He talks about the, the, this uh, symbol is very, very uh, comprehensive and contains an awful lot of information, and the explanation is more than 100 pages, so I can only touch on the things that have to do with sexuality. He calls this one the birth pangs of the new world uh, kingdom. And, and you can see that these birth pangs, they are culminating in the area where we are at the moment. And they are the, the consequences of uh, things like um, unhappy marriages, divorces, jealousy, suicide. It could be the um, uh, contempt and antipathy and persecution that homosexuals and bisexuals and uh, yeah, people with a, a sexuality that's not generally accepted uh, can experience. In some countries, uh, homosexuality is still a punishable offence. And um, what day is it today? Wednesday? I think it, it, tomorrow you'll see, a, the, in the Werden Aktuelt, you'll see a film about um, unfaithfulness, mm -hmm. where it mentions that in some countries, women who are unfaithful to their husbands uh, uh, get the death penalty. So, so there are a lot of birth pangs. Uh, the men got off scot-free, of course, but the, um, the um, there are a lot of there's a lot of pain connected with this this process. But he calls it, calls it birth pangs, and I think it's a great help to understand that. I mean, um, uh, I've never had children myself, but I, I've seen two births, and I know it's a very painful process. But you know there's going, there's going to be a baby at the end of it. So uh, women can generally put up with a lot of pain because they know, they know what's happening. They understand something is being born and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, and I think we can more easily get through this sexual transition if we understand it is actually a, a birth process. So let's talk about more categories. In, in the Leavis book, the Book of Life, Volume 5, which I'm happy to say I've just finished translating. Three weeks before I came up here. <laughs> yes. So the good news is it should be out uh, by the end of the year. Um, I won't give you a date because that's dangerous. But um, yeah, so you'll be able to read these things yourself, which was very, very important for me because I was... When I couldn't read Danish, I was very tired of people explaining these things uh, to me and interpreting them through their own colored glasses, so to speak. So it was very f important for me to read them for myself. So very soon, people who can't read other languages than English will be able to read it for yourself. So, and there's a lot to read. Anyway, he describes 11 sexual categories, A to K, and time is running, so I will, I, and I, I will only take some of them. Um, a uh, corresponds to those 100% reproductive types. They live only for their children and their spouses. Nothing else interests them. Um, and if they're monogamous, then uh, they tend to be happy. Martino says there that the, their honeymoon lasts their whole life. But most of us are not there. Uh, I'll jump over B and go to C. C, uh, human beings C, they, he describes them as being very degenerated as uh, spouses. So if you call your husband a de degenerate, he, that's probably true, <laughs> but I wouldn't risk it. Um, yeah, you don't understand my jokes in English. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, the talent, the talent for marriage uh, has degenerated. And he says... Um, People go from marriage to marriage, like they get on and off of trams, uh, they're going in and out of buses, like you know, going in and out of relationships. Um, there are many divorces in this C category. If your marriage lasts your whole life, it can be because you don't have the heart to hurt your partner. It could also be for financial reasons that it would cause financial problems. And if you're in a marriage like that, it can be a kind of crucifixion. Um, you're not, no longer in love with your partner and you're putting up with the situation because you don't have the heart to, to hurt the other. 
And I think, I think there are an awful lot of people in this category, and one could say that the, their talent for falling in love and remaining in love um, has, ha, I mean, people can fall in love very often, but the, it's the talent to remain in love uh, throughout the whole life um, that's uh, degenerated. That's a weak side, but the strong side is the relationship to society. So they can be geniuses, they can be good at art and literature and music and science and technology and politics and so on. They can do an awful lot of good in the world and they can have a very high moral standard in relation to society. And uh, I'm sure we can find many, many examples of great artists who were terrible husbands or, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, and if we uh, jump rather quickly to what he calls human beings E, the letter E, they are, uh, so if, if C is, he doesn't place these categories uh, in relation to this symbol, but most of us are in these two categories, so I guess C human beings are somewhere here, and E are probably a bit further up, um, but it's hard to know. They are the extremely highly developed bisexual uh, people, and by highly developed, I mean that they're morally very highly developed. So they have a very strong relationship to God, and that protects them from going off the rails or getting into sort of any sort of perversion. They can't offend anyone with their sexuality. As a rule, they're not married, and if they have a sexual relationship with their own sex, then it's very intimate and very unself and unselfish, very discreet, and without any tendency to fall in love or any desire to live together. Um, again, they have great interest in things like art and literature and music and s to a certain degree, he says, to a certain degree science, interesting. They can be geniuses and virtuosos and perhaps even uh, religious leaders. And, th and that's an absolutely normal state. Um, there are, of course, some abnormal states. There are some derailed, uh, perverse states. Uh, for example, sadism and... Um, uh, yeah, you can find both within heterosexuality and homosexuality. You can find sadists and pedophiles and prostitutes and pimps, pyromaniacs, sex murderers, and so on. So. Those Martinus really calls uh, abnormal states, but at the same time he emphasis, emphasizes that we won't all go through abnormal states. And these, of course, are very, very painful for the victims of these states, but they're also uh, painful for those who are in those states. And um, the fact that people end up in a state like that can, um, can be very much due to our ignorance. Martinus writes here, we had the beginning of this quote earlier, I'll take, take it again. The sexual principle or highest fire is the wheel of creation. Everything in the universe is steered by this wheel. A wrong turn here will become a derailment of creation. A complete sexual seduction of a minor is the same as planting a seed that can grow and become a great tree of suffering whose trunk and branches spread up through and over several incarnations or terrestrial lives for the beings concerned. So here we see the, the situation with um, pedophiles. That's just one uh, example of uh, an ab abnormal state. Um, but he does emph emphasize that not everyone will become abnormal. He says, a human being whose morals and ethics are stronger than its sexual drive, need not fear in any way that its future zone of sexual transformation will be a sphere of, an, of unhappiness, apart from the ordinary pangs that always accompany the birth of a new epoch. Everyone must inevi inevitably go through the sexual transformation. No one can, can continue being a male or female being. So... And then we'll quickly go to H. Uh, human being H uh, must be somewhere up here. Um, 
that's a very highly developed heterosexual. So there's some people, you can, you can become what you call sexually conscious in your opposite pole at various stages in evolution. Um, and for some people it happens later than others. In what he calls human being age, um, they remain heterosexual uh, until they're very, very close to initiation, he says. They can feel a very strong affection for their own sex, but it doesn't feel sexual. In the absolute sense, of course, it is sexual, but it doesn't feel sexual in a normal way. It feels like a very, very deep platonic friendship. They can be happily married if they're married uh, to another human being, H. But this is rather unusual. And then in the... When, when uh, human beings H get married, it's usually because um, they got married during what Martinus calls their repetition. Up to the age of 30, we repeat the essence of all our previous lives. And from about 20 to 30, we repeat perhaps the last three or four lives. And of course, we have all been married in the past. So if, let's say you got married at 20, then you're repeating something from four lives ago. And if you had waited until you were 30, you, you might not have got married because you've sort of outlived that now. But now you've gone and done it, you're married. <laughs> so, um, so then you have to uh, live with the consequences. Um, this human being H is very talented. Uh, they can be very interested in spiritual matters. And they can be very, very close to getting cosmic glimpses. They're, they can be um, very empathetic, they have a lot of empathy, and they have a lot of ability to uh, feel how other people are feeling. Um, they, can, they have a lot of insight into how others are reacting to different situations. Um, then we have um, I, human beings, I'll take those very quickly, time is running. They are the um, very, very highly developed homosexuals. They have become what Martinez calls sexually conscious in their opposite pole. Uh, he says the last or final sexual veil has fallen. But they can never use their sexuality to harm anyone or to bother anybody. Their talent for neighborly love is absolutely sovereign. They're extremely helpful. They have an intuitive feeling of God's existence and um, they can feel that everything serves a use, useful purpose. They can have a, a profound feeling that everything is as it should be. Everything is very good. And again, they can have cosmic glimpses. And they can, have, they can be great artists. And they have this double horizon that I mentioned before. They can span both masculine and feminine reactions. If we go further up, and I can place this one, J human beings, that's over this line, because this is where we have cosmic consciousness. This star symbolizes cosmic consciousness. And we see that through our evolution, we gradually get cosmic glimpses, uh, increasingly, more and more, maybe one in a life, and the next life maybe another one, and then two, three, four, and so on increasing in number until we get full cosmic consciousness. And this coincides with uh, um, arrogance and um, what's it called uh, ambition disappearing from our consciousness. So when, when we've reached a, a very humble state, uh, then the cosmic glimpses start. Uh, this is buzzing, I don't know why. Um, uh, there's a little book by Martinus called The Road to Initiation, and some people get a little disappointed because he says the road to initiation is the road of humility. But uh, here he shows that when we become humble enough, then our consciousness begins to open and until we can get total cosmic consciousness. So this J human being, and it's easy to remember J for Jesus, maybe, <laughs> because... Um, there you have cosmic consciousness in a male being, in a male, male body or a female bo body. And then he talks about an, an even higher stage, uh, K 
the human being K, which has um, um, a double-pulled consciousness, and this new organisms, uh, organism, this totally double-pulled organism, which is neither male or female. So we see that this animal organism here, this uh, orange color, is replaced by this real human organism, which develops here. Um, there's an awful lot more one could say about that, but it, um, uh, yeah, you can read the book. <laughs> um, so he talks about these um, K, human beings, K, the, that uh, their sexual act is not an act of copulation or, an act or intercourse, it's an act based on caressing. And he says that any, uh, by touching any animal part of the organism, and he stresses animals, so not nails or hair, but any animal part of the organism will give the, an experience of the absolute highest fire. Um, he says the highest fire blazes and radiates and shines and warms through all its cells. So we feel a wonderful sense of un unbounded joy in being in the presence of another being. So um, he talks about the development of this human sexuality, the development of the ability to caress and to kiss. He talks about the, the tongue and the lips um, developing uh, very much, and um, yeah, he says, if one kisses and caresses during intercourse, then one is no longer 100% a male or female being. One is partly human. That might be nice to know. <laughs> so, so he says intercourse and so on is decreasing while kissing and caressing are on the increase. But he's not telling what people what to do, you know. Uh, so, just to round this off, you, you can see here, this uh, symbol is called the human being with a perfect thought climate, and it, it's actually about health. But, um, and, uh, because when the two sexual poles get into balance, complete balance, then you're incapable of a disharmonious thought. And since it's primarily our thoughts that lie behind our illnesses, then when our thoughts become pure and in harmony with 100% love, then we can't get ill. So what we see here is the primary pole. Uh, he also calls it the sexual pole, the primary pole. So that's the male pole in a man or the female pole in a woman. And here we see the intellectual pole or the, sec or the secondary pole, which is the female pole in the man or the male pole in the woman. And Martinus describes a kind of psychic nerve that grows up through the spine from the sexual organs uh, and down from a center in the brain. And he says that when we become 100% double-pulled, then these two nerve threads will meet around the heart area. And uh, that will create this experience of total cosmic consciousness. So. So we have a very bright future ahead of us. We have a, when, when we get to this stage, we will experience God and everyone and everything. Uh, we will experience this um, ecstasy of seeing that, yeah, I'm only experiencing God and nothing else. But just to say a, a few words about marriage to finish off, that Martinus describes it in this future society that Karen talked about this morning. Then... Um, Marriage will have more of a chance, it will have better conditions. Because at the moment, um, marriage is, is a financial burden. If you have children, you can say, oh, can you really afford to have three children? Or, um, you know, it's, it's an expensive matter. And um, uh, in this new society, one will pay one's own way. Martinus talks about a sort of life passport, that, uh, that uh, you will pay for your own life. During your adult, healthy years, you will pay for your own childhood and for your own old age uh, through the work you do. So um, we won't be a financial burden on our parents. And um, parenthood in itself will be paid. So any hours you spend in looking after children and bringing them up will be put on your own work uh, passport or whatever you call it in English. 
Um, and uh, at the same time, there will be a, a, a fostering of people's individual talents. So, um, for example, if, if a child uh, wants to become a musician or a painter or a scientist or something, and they need some special training or equipment and so on, that will be provided by this world society because society will benefit by everyone getting to develop the talents and um, abilities that they either have and can develop further or don't have and need to develop. So this new society will, will take a lot of pressure off marriage and the bringing up of children, so uh, marriage uh, and family life will actually get easier. Well, you know, th this is a very, very enormous subject, and I could go on and on, but I must stop. There's tea and cake in Tarasen. So um, that's all for now. <laughs>